Two fires clash over the skies of the human heart. One cools, another inflames. Two worlds forever miles apart. These words were from a poem that I wrote about a year ago, speaking about these two different kinds of fire, a dark fire and a secret fire. One of them cools, another inflames. But if you think about it, when you hear a fire that cools versus a fire in flames, doesn't it feel a little tempting to just want to hang out with the cooling fire? Because in flame, that hurts. I don't want to be set on fire. I'd rather to be cooled, comfortable, relaxed. I think of this from a, a memory, sort of a funny memory that I had when I was in college and I was in the rock band scene at that time, and I remember us having a, an outdoor venue, and we had a, um, uh, someone make a bonfire, and this person was very happy about making fires. You know, that kind of person who just maybe adds a little extra to the pile, and it was way bigger for our venue. And so we found ourselves playing this rock music. We had the crowd surfing and the mosh pit and stuff like that. It was a very wild scene. But I remember that fire getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And my brother, Paul, was in the band. And he started to notice that his um, music pages weren't able to move anymore because they'd all been melted together. And then the band, as the fire started to get bigger and bigger and the wind would start, move, start making it move towards the band, the band would all go like that because it was getting a little too hot to handle. And I was a drummer in the band and I remember this experience of all of this ash, molten ash and fire was like falling on the tent right above me. And it was burning holes in the midst of that tarp. Now for me, I'm getting really scared because I'm having fire falling on me. And I'm like, this is a little too close to those really weird 80s concerts and I don't really want to go back there. But burning the holes there, if you just imagine all these people who are in a rock concert, they see smoke, there's light, and now there's holes that are shooting beams all into the sky. And so they went even crazier, and they thought it was part of the act. But in my mind, I'm thinking, i got to get out of here. I'm going to die. So I thought about that funny image when I was thinking about Jesus' words here. He says, I've come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. And we might say, yes, Jesus, that'd be awesome. It'll be cool. Have your fire. Let the fire fall. But I started remembering that moment in which my band moved away from the fire because we didn't want it to inflame. It hurts. I'd rather be in the cooling fire, is what my heart would say. But that is where the trap is, because the cooling fire is what we call the dark fire. It's the opposite of how fire works, and yet it destroys instead of heals. A dark fire is super cold. And anything that it touches, if you have something really cold and you touch it to something warm, what happens to all of that warmth? It starts to get sucked out like a vampire on its prey. And it takes the warmth of light and life and warmth 
and love and meaning and purpose and all of those things that are good and beautiful. And it pulls it out like a spider eats from the inside and just leaves the shell. And if you think about different kinds of images, you see this a lot in fantasy literature. You have the Nazgul's, you have the Dementors, you have the Spectres, you have these different kinds of creatures, and the scary part about them is that they're really empty because their life has been sucked out of them. They are the living dead in a certain sense. And that's what's being attempted on with Jeremiah. Jeremiah has the fire of God's love within him. And it set, he even says, it's burning me. I can't hold it in. I have to proclaim it. And he proclaims that word of God, which is a word of conversion to his homeland. And the people don't want to hear it. And so they become servants of that dark fire that wants to cool the fire take away its light, and make it a stone. And the way they want to do that with Jeremiah is they pick him up and they throw him into a cistern that doesn't have any water. It's filled with mud. Think about what, how mud caked over can just insulate that warmth away from being spread. It makes cool. It makes a stone. And so he's sinking in the midst of that. It's the epitome of what you call the cancel culture, which is I don't want this warmth. I don't want this light. I need to snuff it out. I need to make it hollow. And so Jeremiah sinks into that mud, but he's not left alone. Someone comes and lifts him out of that miry clay. And you know what's beautiful is that psalm that we just sang, Psalm 40, which you might not realize this, but the band U2 actually wrote a song called 40, which is word for word this responsorial psalm. I encourage you to look it up on YouTube sometime. It's actually a very powerful prayer. But that psalm is Jeremiah's story. It says, I've waited, I've waited for the Lord, and he stooped toward me. He heard my cry. He drew me out of the pit of destruction, out of the mud of the swamp. He set my feet upon a rock. He made my footsteps firm, and then he put a new song into my mouth to praise God. And many shall look in awe, and they shall trust in the Lord from that song. Isn't that what we just heard about Jeremiah's life? And it's really a story of our lives. Because as the second reading talks about, we're surrounded by this so great a cloud of witnesses that we are called to rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us so that we can persevere in running the race, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the inspirer and perfecter of our faith. That whole experience of having the mud caked onto us, that dark fire that wants to smother the life and warmth of God within us, Jesus has come to scoop us out of that pit and to burn away that shell of mud that is trying to insulate the fire and snuff it out. But that hurts to have something burned away. So it's true, there is, like my rock band was moving away from the fire, there is a natural tendency within us to say, I'd rather stay with the cooling part, even if it means I fall asleep into a stone, because it hurts to be burned. And yet, are all burning hurts bad? Think about a forest or a prairie land. We do controlled fires 
in order to burn away the things that are smothering the trees and plants that should be there. Think about someone getting over an addiction. The burn of allowing the power of that addiction to be broken like a chain. It hurts, it's painful. But someone going through that whole process is not going to look back at that moment of pain saying, I wish it never happened. Because they're experiencing the freedom of life. The freedom of having all of that caked on mud that was smothering them to actually be free. To be who they were made to be. Not everything that burns and hurts is bad. And yet Satan wants to deceive us. He says, don't go into that fire. You're going to get hurt. Stay with me. Fall asleep in my song. That is the song of a vampire taking little by little our very life from us until we become a wraith and a Nazgul. So the Lord's calling us to have courage and to fall into that fire because it's there that we'll find the healing and a very surprise of paradoxes. And as that fire grows within you, that dark fire will not want that fire to continue. And we hear about that in the gospel today. We hear that as Jesus pours this fire of his love, it's really the embracing of his love that burns away all these things that get in the way of love. But as that fire grows, the dark fire wants to put us back in that cistern, wants to cover us over. This is this whole experience of the division that will happen even within our families. Two against three, three against two the most intimate of relationships, father and son, mother and daughter, all of these different things, that there is this brokenness that happens, but it's ultimately to bring, be bringing to the deeper healing, to be willing to go through that, as the second reading says, even to the point of shedding blood, so that we can truly be made new again. We have to be undone in order to be reforged. And I leave you with a final image. We're going to nerd out a little here and do a little Tolkien because this actually is the best image for this. You have the very famous image of Gandalf the Grey fighting against the demon of the ancient world, the Balrog. And listen to the words of Gandalf in the Fellowship of the Ring. He says, I am a servant of the secret fire. The dark fire will not avail you. Go back to the shadow. And in this, you see the clash of two different kinds of fire. The fire that takes and the fire that burns away the darkness. And he has to fall in order to be remade. He falls into the abyss with that dark fire and smites it and comes back not as Gandalf the Grey, but as Gandalf the White, stronger, because he was willing to throw himself into the secret fire and have everything burned away so that he could be, me- he could be reforged anew to be now that burning light that pushes away darkness. And so let the baptism, the being plunged into the fire of God's love to happen. It will hurt. It will be painful, but it will burn away the selfishness and make your heart generous. And then you will be lifted out from that miry clay. You will be given a new song on your lips. And through that light of that song that is spoken forth, many shall look on in awe and shall trust in the Lord because you will be filled with that fire. And as people get close to you, May they catch the fire that burns away selfishness and brings forth light, love, and what we were made to be from the beginning. 
images and likenesses of God Almighty.